Hello and welcome to Mickeyology, where we take Disney movies a little bit too seriously in an ongoing attempt to trace them back to their most likely historical settings. I'm Austin Rathall, professional history teacher and lifelong Disney devotee. It's been a while since I've posted a video, so we are covering two movies today. We are examining one of the most famous, beloved, and magical stories in the Disney catalog, Beauty and the Beast. Anyone who is familiar with these movies knows they take place in France, but where exactly and when? Join me in examining the tale as old as time and see if there is something there you didn't see before. Clue number one, art and architecture. Beauty and the Beast is rich with architectural detail. By examining the film's sets, we can gain clues as to when and where it takes place. Let's start with Bell's Village. This provincial town has no name, but it does have hints as to its location. The town resembles several real French villages, so much so that Disney offered tourists the chance to visit one in 2017. Disney advertised a new Beauty and the Beast themed cruise experience that would take guests to Riquevere, an idyllic French village that, as Disney's travel department claimed, will make guests feel as though they've stepped into Belle's hometown from the movie. Riquevere is located near the Vosges Mountains in eastern France, and as you can see, it bears more than a passing resemblance to Belle's quiet village. Therefore, if Bell's village was real, it would likely reside somewhere around that same location. The live-action version, however, takes place in a real town, Villeneuve. In the official Disney publication Tale as Old as Time, author Charles Solomon wrote, quote, The new film of Beauty and the Beast is set not in an unspecified French environment like the animated movie, but in a specific place, the village of Villeneuve in southern France, in the year 1740. Villeneuve is a real place in southern France. It is also the surname of the original story's author. However, production designer Sarah Greenwood drew inspiration from many places when designing the sets, including Conque, France, and Rotenburg, Germany. Still, while the town may be an amalgam of European villages, we know Belle's live-action home is, officially, Villeneuve. That settles the location of the town, but what about the Beast's castle? In the animated film, Cogsworth gives Belle a tour of the castle, during which he says, As you can see, the pseudo facade was stripped away to reveal a minimalist Rococo design. Note the unusual inverted vaulted ceilings. This is yet another example of the late neoclassic Baroque period. And as I always say, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. <laughs> Cogsworth mentions three art movements here Baroque, Rococo, and Neoclassical. The Baroque period lasted from the late 16th century through the 17th century. Baroque artists created works with a dramatic and ethereal style. Baroque paintings often display sharp contrasts between light and dark. Eagle-eyed Disney fans can spot a famous Baroque painting, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, hanging in the castle hall. The Baroque period gave way to the Rococo, which lasted from 1730 until 1770. Rococo artists created works that were whimsical and playful. In other words, very froofy. Both the animated and live action versions of the film contain a lot of Rococo designs. The ceiling of the ballroom in the animated movie's castle features fluffy clouds, pastel colors, and naked cherubs typical of Rococo paintings. The production designer for the live action film, Sarah Greenwood, liked the idea of Rococo so much that she said, quote, all our draft people had to do Rococo boot camp. Because of this commitment to Rococo in the live action film, all the objects in the castle display Rococo style designs. Finally, there's neoclassicism, which began in the 1760s and lasted until the mid 19th century. Neoclassicism emerged during the enlightenment 
and neoclassic artists emphasized rationality, science, and, well, the classics. I don't know of any neoclassic pieces on display in the castle, but the castle does have an elaborate library. This library not only symbolizes everything neoclassicism was about, but it also resembles the real library in the Chateau de Chantilly. The Duke of Umal began this massive book collection during the neoclassic era, and it grew to include over 60,000 volumes. To be fair though, I think the Beast's collection has that one beat. Cogsworth's description of the castle's architecture dates it to sometime in the mid to late 1700s. This makes sense, since the castle resembles several real-life French castles, or chateaux. Animators visited the Chateau de Chambord on their research trip for the 1991 film, and Sarah Greenwood visited it when she did research for the 2017 version. Francis I oversaw Chambord's construction in the early 1500s, and it now features Rococo designs. Another chateau, the Vaux le Vicomte, features a grand salon that bears a remarkable resemblance to the ballroom in which Belle and the Beast share their iconic dance. The live-action version of the castle also drew influence from a Rococo church in Bavaria and the Palace of Versailles, famous for its Rococo decorations. Versailles, Chambord, and Vaux le Vicomte all reside in the central to northern region of France. So, the Beast's Castle would probably reside somewhere in that region as well. We can therefore deduce that the village in the animated film lies somewhere in central France, the village in the live-action film lies in the south of France, and the Beast's Castle in both versions of the film lies somewhere in northern France. We now know where the movie takes place, and we know when the live-action movie takes place, 1740. But what about the animated film? When does it take place? Clue number two, fashion. During the early stages of production, animators working on Beauty and the Beast designed characters wearing 18th century costumes. The original script set the story in the year 1709. Eventually though, the crew changed their approach and gave characters more timeless attire. However, the film's two most famous outfits still fit in a specific period of French fashion. In the ballroom scene, the Beast wears a suit with a waistcoat, white cravat, and dark breeches. European men began wearing suits in the late 17th century. Cravats originated in 1636 and quickly became a popular fashion accessory in Paris. After the French Revolution, which began in 1789, breeches went out of fashion and men adopted the pants worn by the lower classes. In revolutionary France, it was much safer to look lower class, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Beast, therefore, appears to be wearing pre-revolution clothing, which puts the movie sometime before 1789. Unlike in the live-action version, Belle's ball gown in the animated film appears to be a crinoline dress, which became popular in France beginning in 1719. These dresses featured a framework made of whalebone or other materials that gave the dress its shape. Above the skirt, women wore a laced bodice with a plunging neckline, and in 1750, women began sporting elbow-length gloves with the crinoline. And in the 1760s, it became fashionable for a crinoline wearer to put her hair high on the head with ringlets falling over her shoulders. All this indicates that Bell's outfit dates to the period immediately before the Revolution, perhaps only a decade before the storming of the Bastille. The live-action version of the film features different, more elaborate costumes. Since the producers wanted to set the film in a specific year, 1740, they dressed characters in 18th century style. Costume designer Jacqueline Durand designed Gaston's costume after an 18th century army uniform, added lace to Belle's blue village dress, and gave Madame de Garderobe an enormous ball gown and towering wig. These designs placed the live-action film in pre-revolutionary France as well, though not quite as late in that period as the animated version.
While Beauty and the Beast is fictional, several episodes from French history echo the story in intriguing ways. For example, beastliness even affected French royalty. Henri Jules, Prince of Condé, was a member of the Bourbon dynasty who suffered from a condition called clinical lycanthropy. Clinical lycanthropy is a rare psychological condition that causes an individual to believe he is transforming into an animal, often a werewolf. The Prince of Condé sometimes believed he was a dog and exhibited signs of madness until his death in 1709. A darker incident occurred in the 1760s when a mysterious beast began attacking villagers in southern France. The beast of Gévaudan would kill women and children, cutting its victims' throats or even decapitating them. The beast claimed the lives of almost 300 villagers and drew the attention of King Louis XV, who dispatched hunters to the region and offered a 6,000 livre reward for anyone who could dispatch the creature. At one point, 30,000 men volunteered to <clears throat> kill the beast, but none of them succeeded. Several victims did manage to survive the beast's attacks. Contemporary accounts described the beast as having a breast as wide as a horse, red fur, and fiery eyes. Some said it had talons on its feet and a panther-like tail. Some even claimed it could walk on its hind legs, repel bullets, and demonstrated an incredible leaping ability. Although it has been centuries since his last attack, the beast remains a mystery to this day. Clue number three, historical events. Both versions of Beauty and the Beast hint at real historical events, although the live action version does so much more overtly than the animated. Probably the most overt reference to real history comes when the Beast and Belle visit her childhood home in Paris, and she learns that her mother died of the plague. You must leave. Now. Quickly, before it takes her too. This scene refers to a real plague that affected France from 1720 to 1722. A ship carrying infected crewmen arrived in Marseille in May 1720, and by the time officials quarantined the crew and confiscated the infected cargo, it was too late. Fleas carrying the disease began infecting people in the city, and by July, there was an epidemic in Marseille. 43.7% of Marseille's population died as a result. The timing of this plague fits perfectly with Beauty and the Beast, taking place roughly 20 years before the events of the film. Another reference to history comes from Gaston and LeFou, who reminisce about the former's time in The War. Ever since the war, I felt like I've been missing something. Keep happy thoughts. Go back to the war! But in which war is Gaston likely to have served? Well, I think the best candidate is the War of the Polish Succession, in which France supported Louis XV's father-in-law's bid for the Polish throne. This war lasted from 1733 to 1738. That is just in time to get Gaston home from the war and back to Villeneuve for the events of the 1740 film. You can even see paintings of soldiers wearing uniforms identical to Gaston's in paintings of that war. In both the animated and live-action versions of the film, Gaston also uses a distinctive gun with a bell-shaped muzzle. This gun appears to be a musketoon or blunderbuss. Blunderbusses originated in the late 16th century and remained popular through the 19th century. Gunmakers crafted many different versions of these weapons, but Gaston's appears to resemble these models, which date to the mid-1700s, once again confirming that this movie takes place in pre-revolution France. Lastly, there is this mysterious prince who is apparently powerful enough to live in a castle and surround himself with servants, and yet insignificant enough that he can disappear without his country taking much notice. Now the live action version of the film ties up this loose end by making the enchantress cast a memory spell on the villagers. Still, aren't princes the rulers of their countries, or at least next in line to the throne? How could a prince possibly disappear without throwing his country into some kind of chaos? As it turns out, the answer is pretty simple. 
Like other monarchs throughout European history, French kings often had multiple sons, so of course there would often be multiple princes alive at one time. But even nephews and other more distant relatives of the king could be considered princes. France had a title for these male relatives who traced their lineage back to French royalty. They called them princes of the blood. These were men who, in theory, could ascend to the throne if no other legitimate successor could be found. However, plenty of these princes lived their entire lives without ever taking the crown, and the line of succession could include something like a thousand men altogether. Therefore, these princes could live in their own castles separate from the main royal family and have their own families and servants. For example, while Louis XIV lived at the Palace of Versailles, his relative, the Prince of Condé, lived in the Chateau Chantilly. It is therefore not unreasonable to imagine that one of France's minor princes, a prince of the blood, might occupy his own chateau and disappear without causing too great a stir, especially if an enchantress cast a memory spell on his relations. Conclusion. Based on the movie's architecture, fashion, and historical allusions, I am placing the animated version of Beauty and the Beast in central France, circa 1770, and I am placing the live-action version in central and southern France, circa 1740. So what do you think of my conclusions? When and where do you think these films take place? Let me know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to tell me which Disney movie you would like me to analyze next. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.